Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the first very essential fundamental idea of the theory of everything is boundlessness. After all, according to the first fundamental proposition, there is an omnipresent, eternal, boundless and immutable principle. Everything from the smallest particle to the most vast cosmos Everything we see and we cannot see belongs to, yes, is in essence boundlessness. But this principle alone is not enough to explain everything. How do things come into being? How do universes, worlds, humans come into being? What is the purpose of all those beings and does nothing ever change. Two other propositions are needed to explain all this, and in this talk I will give one of them cyclicity, the coming and going of beings. In a boundless life, manifestations take place with the regularity of the clock. Although rooted in the boundlessness, these manifestations are limited. In the secret doctrine, this premise is formulated as follows. The eternity of the universe in total as a boundless plane. Periodically, the playground of numberless universes incessantly manifesting and disappearing, called the manifesting stars and the sparks of eternity. The eternity of the pilgrim is like a wink of the eye of self-existence, according to the book of Zian. And the appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a regular tidal ebb of flux and reflux. Well, that's quite a mouthful. And we'll try to discuss the main elements of this second proposition. The eternity of the universe in total. What is meant by this? In total means completely, in, in its totality. In other words, this is about the enormous expense, the incalculable space and everything that goes with it. It is something which exists in all eternities, has always been and always will be. Try to imagine it as far as you can. Try to imagine a plane or an area, if you can use that word, that is billions and billions of light years large, and in which billions of galactic systems or galaxies are located. And now we are only talking about what is perceptible to our senses, and that is only a cross-section of all cosmic worlds. This enormous area, which is impossible for us to grasp, is periodically the playground of coming and going of universes. And that may sound strange that a universe is the playground of countless universes. It means that in this gigantic universe, constantly smaller universes manifest themselves and withdraw from it. To put it in human terms, they are born into it, die and withdraw from it, and are then born again into it. That's the law of cyclicity. So what are these universes? A universe or a cosmos is an ordered living whole. In fact, Size does not matter. For example, our solar system with its planets is a universe. But the Milky Way with its millions of sun is just as much a universe. And a man, a human being, is a universe too, a microcosmos. 
So all living beings are universes, no matter how big or small they are. And all these living beings come to existence, appear, are active for a period of time, and then disappear, or, as humans tend to call it, they die. Is there a difference between these universes? And now we come to a very, a very important thought. No, there is no essential difference between those universes. And that is explained in the following idea from this second proposition. These universes are called sparks of eternity. In theosophical literature, they are also referred to by another name, monads. Later on, we tell a bit more about these monads, but we can already say that these monads are, in essence, boundless. So they have always lived, and they will always live. Every universe, including man, but also an animal, a plant, a mineral, is a monad and has always been there. So there can never be creation in the sense that something appears for the first time. That a being can appear out of nowhere. That is impossible because everything has always been there. The fact that all beings, including us, have always been there is expressed in the words eternal pilgrim. The pilgrim is the monad which constantly grows in consciousness, in wisdom. An important thought that also comes to the fore in the third proposition. Well, all those monads come and go like the ebb and the flow of the sea. They are subject to cyclicity. What do we understand by a cycle? A cycle is a periodically recurring period of time in which an evolving being expresses its abilities. Take as a simple example the cycle of waking and sleeping of a human being. Every morning we get up and begin our active period. During this period we can learn, we can grow in knowledge, in skills, in consciousness. And when that active period ends, we enter a period of rest, and sleep is what we call it. And the next day we repeat the process, albeit on a slightly higher level, assuming we have learned something the previous day. And what applies to a human being applies to all monads, solar systems, planets, but also atoms, you name it. All manifestations are monads, and everywhere, monads manifest themselves cyclically. So with each cycle, there is an alternation of a period of activity and rest. The time span in which this takes place differs. A cycle of the four seasons, for instance, logically, lasts 365 days. Well, that of a day and night lasts 24 hours, and in the atomic world, you will encounter cycles of fractions of a second. Well, in the cosmos, a cycle can sometimes be expressed in billions of years. But the basic idea is the same everywhere. The alternation of activity and passivity. The transition into activity is called birth or awakening, and the transition into rest is called dying or falling asleep. We could give countless examples of cycles, sleeping and waking, the four seasons, the moon phase, day and night, ebb and flow, the beating of the heart. The monad, so the living being, always goes from an active period, for humans we call it an incarnation, to a passive period. We call this transition dying. Death, however, is not an absence of life, but another a passive phase 
through which a moment moves. Then there is another transition into being active again. We call that transition birth. As long as we realize that behind a cycle, consciousness works, a monad is active, we have the right image of a cycle. In other words, there are monads which constantly manifest themselves cyclically. Let us therefore go a bit deeper in those sparks of eternity, in those monads. Monads are indivisible units. They are reflections of the boundless and are therefore in their core also boundless. Starting from the boundless, omnipresent, eternal and immutable principle of the first fundamental proposition, monads are equally boundless. After all, everything belongs to that boundless principle. As sparks of eternity, they have all the essences within them, what we can call the central boundless fire. Or to express it in another metaphor, each moment is a wave or a ripple in the boundless ocean of beingness. As a wave, it is part of that ocean, and it is everything that ocean is. That's why you can also say of monads that they are omnipresent. That means that they are everywhere. You cannot say that they occupy a certain place. It is said that the circumference of a monad is nowhere and the center is everywhere. Monads are eternal. So they are not created, they cannot die in the absolute sense of the word. They have always been and will always be there. Furthermore, monads are boundless. In essence, they have all potential and all possibilities within them. There is no power that you or I, but also an animal and plant, do not have within us whether we have developed that capacity, made it active, is another matter. And then comes a difficult thought. Monads are immutable, and yet they are constantly changing. How should we see that? Well, in essence, they are the boundless, and the boundless can never change. Yet they change all the time. And by that we mean that they always go from one state to another. That is also apparent from the fact that they manifest themselves constantly, cyclically. Their changeability consists in giving more and more expression to the unchangeable per se, in other words, the boundless. Finally, there is a very important thought regarding monads. They are essentially one, and they always, they are always, they live always in relation to each other. Indeed, they would not be able to manifest themselves without other monads. Yet, monads also differ from each other. In theosophical literature, you can therefore, therefore find terms like human monad, animal monad, divine monad. How can we explain that when every monad is essentially the same as any other monad? The explanation can be found in the fact that not every monad has unwrapped the same fac faculties, the same qualities out of itself. And we deliberately use the word that maybe in this context sound strange, yeah, the word unwrap, but we do that because that word exactly indicates the process. Out of the infinite capacities which are wrapped up in the monad, the monad unwraps or unwinds capacities and that means it makes them 
active. To clarify this, take two more or less similar seeds of a sunflower. Put one in a pot in March. Soon there will be a stem, then leaves will appear. Don't put the other one in a pot until May or June. Wait a few days and you will see a very small dot above the earth. Does this barely visible plant differ from the other one, which has almost become a sunflower by now? No, it only differs in the unwrapping stage. The only difference lies in the extent to which both have developed, both have unwrapped. We name a monad after its unfolding stage. So when a monad is unwinding or unwrapping or unfolding the animal consciousness within it, then we speak of an animal monad. And when it moves through the human realm, it develops the human, the thinking consciousness, then it is called a human monad, and so on. But in essence, all monads are the same. They are identical to each other. If we realize that, our ethical awareness grows. We will never despise, we will never discriminate against people. And it also makes us look at animals very differently. If we now relate the ideas about monads and cycles to each other, we get a better understanding of both a monad and a cycle. How does a cycle come into being? Well, there is an interaction between different monads. And this interaction arises on the one hand because there is a difference in development, but on the other hand because there is a characteristic similarity between those monads. Let me try to clarify this with the birth of a human, an example which is always the easiest for us because we are human beings. What happens when a human being is born? The human monad has had its period of rest and feels an attraction to a manifest existence, just as we wake up after a night's rest. We cannot go deep into that urge now, but it has everything to do with the previous phase in the cycle, so the previous life. Well, in order to be born, in order to be active again, the human monad needs a body, or rather a vehicle, because apart from the physical body, there are other vehicles which are required to be able to manifest. Now we said that everything is a monad. So if we restrict ourselves to the human body to keep it easy, this body is made up of countless monads, the cells, the molecules, the atoms which compose the body. Let us call them vehicle of material monads for our convenience. They are still a long, long way from the development level, the unwrapping level of a human monad. Yet in a certain respect, they have the same characteristic. They are tuned in the same tone, as it were, although not in the same octave. So it is through this interaction between the human monad and the more material monads that the cycle of human life arises. It may be hard to imagine, but we, human monads, play the same role in relation to the monads which are much more developed than we and which we can call divine monads. The gods, uh, the divine monads, those monads who are developing universal consciousness, need us too to manifest themselves in the same extent as we need the less developed monads with respect to us. And you see, the old nature shows a magnificent and majestic cooperation. 
And this cooperation, this interaction between monads, certainly does not end when man is born. Of course, his body remains intact and he has to keep working with those less developed monads. But for his growth, his development, development of more consciousness, he needs other monads. And these are in the first place his fellow human beings, his fellow pilgrims. We learn from each other, especially also humans who are further developed than we are. Our teachers are needed. What is less well known is that a person also needs the monads above the human kingdom, who give, as it were, the spiritual food that the human monads have to digest in order to grow further. In this way, a human being, in conjunction with others, always gains experience during the active period of the cycle. He processes that experience during the rest period. And that is why cyclicity should not be understood so much as spinning in circles, because then you forget the element of growth. Yes, you go in circles, but just like a spiral staircase, you go up in circles. In other words, the process of appearing and disappearing will cause a moment to develop more and more capacities out of itself. The pilgrim grows in consciousness. So there is always cooperation between monads. They cannot live, they cannot exist without other monads. There is no isolation. Pure individual growth is therefore impossible. An important fact for our attitude to life. Collaboration exists mainly because there are differences in level between monads, as we have seen, and from this too we could draw an important conclusion for the practice of our life. Furthermore, we have found that there are both more and less unwrapped or developed monads with respect to humans. We call the first group spiritual monads, and the second group consists of what to us are material monads, but in essence they are the same. Spirit and matter are therefore relative concepts, as Lali Bell said already in her lecture. Spirit and matter are one, they are two phases of the same life, and depending on your own degree of development, you call something spiritual or material. Compare it with uh, the states of aggregation in chemistry, water, water vapor, liquid water and ice are in essence the same H2O, only the state it is in differs. This what we call matter and what we call spirit is the same life, only it is in different states. Human monads, and that are monads which move through the phase of human development, these human monads as manifested beings have both a spiritual and a material element. We can choose which side within us we allow to prevail. If we choose the, to live mainly in the spiritual side, then the process of development, of unwinding, in other words, the growth of consciousness, will go well. We will be better and better able to express human consciousness. In the next lecture, this will be discussed in more detail. Finally, we want to give a few consequences of the first and the second proposition, which are very important in connection with the theory of everything. If we could organize our lives on the basis of the first two propositions, and then we haven't 
not even discuss the third, society would look very different. What are those consequences? First of all, monads, so we humans too, don't know any endpoint. There is no absolute endpoint. We can always grow. Mistakes made in this life can be corrected in the next. Further, monads, so we humans too, always are different from each other. That makes life rich and beautiful. And therefore, if we use our talents for the greater good, we can also grow together. But we are also equal. After all, we are all monads, so nobody is more worth than another. Another consequence, we have boundless, a boundless potential. We are noble beings. We can build a beautiful society. Each one of us can come to a great understanding of cosmic laws, can defy his consciousness, extend it to cosmic proportions. For that we need each other. We cannot expand our consciousness any further as an isolated being. How unnatural is therefore selfishness? How ignorant are therefore people who grant themselves or their family or their group or their country more rights and more wealth than others? Because isolation does not exist. The feeling of separation, thinking that you are different, that you are better than others, is therefore the most unnatural feeling. Everything exists with and within each other. There is an all-embracing web of life of which we all are integral parts. Cooperation is a fact in nature, and therefore we have to bring ourselves into the whole, but also make sure that others can do the same. We want to conclude with a second building block for the theory of everything. The first building block was the answer of the question, what is everything? Everything is boundless, boundless life. And where, the second question, where does everything come from? Everything appears and disappears cyclically by the interaction of monads that differ in stage of development. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>